Welcome to episode 83, Cultivating Your Resilience Spirit, Letting Go of Numbing and Powerlessness, Brene Brown's Guidepost Guidepost 3. Join us as we discuss the spectrum of powerlessness from numbing to distancing. And as we talk about our resilient spirit that holds toughness and elasticity like a tree going through a hurricane. Mm. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Witchy Wit Podcast, where we look at life through a witchy lens. I'm Kimberlyn. I'm Leilani. At Witchy Wit, we explore current events, ideas, music and books, and experiences in ways that recognize energy and life in everybody and everything. We are both real witches. And we bring two real perspectives through the lens of our different ages, races, and backgrounds. With a healthy skepticism for what we have been told is true, our conversations are raw, candid, and vulnerable. Join us as we cast a spell to uncover what we each know is true in our intuitive, witchy selves. Welcome to episode 83. Brene Brown, Guidepost 3. Cultivating your resilient spirit. Letting go of numbing. And powerlessness. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So yeah, there we go. Before we get started, shall we take care of a little housekeeping? I'd love to. Okay. So we are doing a meet and greet for our Patreon supporters, and that is going to be on March 23rd at 1030 a.m. Central Time. Yes. You can get more information about that by heading over to the Witchy Wit Patreon, and we have lots of the details there. Yes. Well, we don't right now but oh will. It, it'll be there oh that's right yes it will be there by the time you hear this yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay there we go Let, hold on let's check in with our social media and patreon manager and ask her oh that's me <laughs> <laughs> yeah we just handled the scheduling through our scheduling people which Wait, are let's us. Check. oh that's us <laughs> And we also coordinated it with our... Um, the Zoom people. Yeah. Oh, that's also us. That's also us. Yes. So. And our audio engineer. That would be me. That's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, all of our people are on board with this and I think it's going to be fabulous. Yeah. We're really excited to get to hang out with y'all, um, do a question and answer, and then just kind of see where the the desire takes us mm-hmm. and kind of let the people who show up shape what we do. Exactly. Yay. But before we, well, that's like a long time away, but before we jump into today's topic of Brene Brown Guidepost 3, I thought we could maybe take a moment and check in and see how we're doing. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm going to start. That sounds great. And um, I am going to, I just finished a book from my book group. It's by an author, a relatively young author named Hanya Yanagihara. Um, and the book is called A Little Life. Hmm. Um incredible, incredible writing, incredible writing. Shoot a long, I highly recommend the book. It's super, super long. So, you know, uh, if you decide you're going to read it, make sure that you have the time and that you have the emotional bandwidth because, wow. um, one of the characters in this has just gone through so much abuse as a child. Um, even as an adult, um, there's, you know, there's so much pain and anguish and shame and guilt in this person's life. And um, one of the things that uh, the author, Yana Gihara, is good at is writing inner dialogue. So I found myself really empathizing with uh, with all of the characters. I mean, she, she wrote a number of different characters. And, and I think I, I, I f- feel as if she really fleshed them out and made them real and, and made me get involved with them. And, and generally... and, and Generally, when when we have these stories of people, usually they're called uplifting stories of people overcoming, Mm -hmm. um, you know, overcoming difficulties, obstacles. And this is this kind of resonates for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I I I I tend to not like those books because before they get to the uplifting part, which is usually we survived. I mean, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily that they're thriving it's just that they've survived but in the meantime you've the three quarters of the book is about all of the the anguish and sorrow and pain and Mm -hmm. and degradation and and on a and i know this is fiction it's not like social media or news but we've developed this kind of um 
tendency in our society to uh, to utilize a technique that um, the, the the original term I think was poverty porn, but I but now we uh, people kind of lump them all together now, and it's called social pornography or mm-hmm. social porn. Okay. This idea of of highlighting and and making really really vivid pain or anguish or poverty or whatever. In many cases, it's to encourage people to donate mm-hmm. um, or to to take some sort of action. Um, but often the picture painted is so vivid that it can also encourage a little bit of, um, you know, kind of de- not delighting in their misery, but, you know, kind of relishing the misery because you like schadenfreude, you know, yeah. not really schadenfreude, but you know, you're, you're not, ex- you're not, it's like there, but for the grace of God, mm-hmm. you know, type of thing. And, and often it's a way for people to then spend money so that they don't have to feel anything. And this uh-huh. comes back, totally comes back to what we're going to be talking uh-huh. about today, um, about the situation itself by really like, like grabbing you and, and, and tor- tormenting you by, you know, the, I, I grew up with the pictures of the children in Biafra with the extended uh-huh. bellies and the, the really, really, um, exposed ribs it's not exposed but highlighted ribs and stuff mm-hmm. and so you know but these pictures so so it you know we have these pictures we have this kind of um this kind of journalism that uh that uh, continues that um we see this so much in um in reality television you know where people are kind of encouraged to drop their boundaries and their their um their uh normal pri- uh, levels of privacy because this is a way for them to get some money or, you know, and so, so anyway, I say all of that because, um, I don't, I don't really enjoy that type of right. I mean, I don't know if anyone really, really enjoys it. I don't want to even go there, but, um, I don't really enjoy that. And so when I get to these books, I tend to just not read them. I mean, mm-hmm. I just, you know, I get to the first time that they're really degraded or humiliated, um, or, or rate, you know, all of these different scenarios and, and I'll give it a little bit more time, a little bit more time. And then if it just continues and that person just becoming more and more degraded, I just, I check out. Mm-hmm. Um, and this book, I, I mean, it's, it is, um, I listened to the audio book. It was 32 wow. hours, 32 hours like, or 31, something like that. And so for me to stick with this, mm-hmm. it had to have been really, really powerful writing and it was powerful writing. And, um, and it, but it addresses, you know, like, um, uh, sexual abuse, child abuse, um, you know, f- suicide, uh, you know, just all these things. And you can't, the characters constantly being slammed and slammed and slammed. And it was only because of the, the incredible writing that I continued with this. But, um, it just reminded me of, of how many of these types of books for various reasons that I just start and don't finish because mm-hmm. it's just not my, my jam. So, um, I highly, re- <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's not, I, I can say for me, it's not social pornography. Mm-hmm. So for people who really, really want some good writing, it's not necessarily an uplifting story though. It, you know, there, there, there is an ending in which people kind of come to terms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, um, the author is Hanya Yana Gihara and the book is A Little Life. And I think it won a, a number of awards back oh. when it, uh, when it pu- was published back, I think, 2015, 2016. Wow. So, yeah. So what about with you? What's going <laughs> I just finished this book yesterday, so I'm still kind of processing mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and it's, it's still kind of coloring my day. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but hopefully you have something a little bit more uplifting to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have something totally different coloring my day. Okay, okay good. Um, good. But thanks for being willing to switch gears because this is gonna, this is like yeah pull us out of this, this is please a big gear station. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I just went to a dance competition this past weekend, mm-hmm. and uh, it was I had a blast. I danced so, so much, and I was talking to my partner, and it was after Friday night. I danced from four p.m. until a little bit after midnight. So that's that's eight that's eight plus hours. And I, I came home and then I, I said to him, I said, do you think dancing for over eight hours counts as Camino prep? <laughs> well, huh. And that's not, I mean, yeah. and that wasn't my intent for doing it. <laughs> but I mean, I was on my feet you moving were. around for yeah. eight plus hours. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were literally moving. I was. So that's, that was a day on the Camino. 
Yeah. That was a day. You just did a day on the Camino. Yeah. But on the dance floor. But on the dance floor. With with a whole bunch of, well, I guess on the Camino, there's a whole bunch of other people yeah. too. But yeah. But they're, they're not dancing. Yeah. The music might be different. The music will definitely be different. <laughs> it'll, it'll just be us chanting. Yeah. And, and yeah. people avoiding us. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> why are they singing? What's going on? Yeah, we'll pay, we'll pay once, you know. Like, right, that's, yeah, yeah. That's program said, like, yeah. stop it. Yeah. <laughs> Join in if you want. You know. So, well, well, good for you. Yeah. Yay. So, in case our listeners um, haven't heard, we're going, we're doing the Camino de Santiago, kind of. Um, Unless they, this is their first, <laughs> their first episode. They, I, yeah. yeah. In June, uh, where we'll be walking up the path of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. we have lots of episodes about what we're actually doing. Mm-hmm. But, um but yeah, so I, I, I've I counted as Camino prep. Work it, I've girl. decided that yes, it is Camino prep. Dancing for <laughs> Check eight that hours off. is Camino prep. Work it, work it. Yay, good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, and overall, I felt great. Mm-hmm. Uh, the balls of my feet are sore, but I think that's also unique to the style of dance because I'm grinding. I'm rolling You're through digging my feet. In. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. I dig using the the balls of my feet and then roll through. So. Mm-hmm. Are but, you wearing heels or are you wearing flats? I was wearing heels. Yep, that'll do it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so overall, I'm like, I'm, pr- I'm feeling pretty Work good. It. Yeah. So that was your weekend. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And good then I you. danced again. I danced uh, for five hours and then three hours. I took a break in the middle and went and had dinner on Saturday. On Saturday. Yeah. So I'm doing multiple days in a row, feeling pretty good. Yeah, that was your Camino prep. Yeah. For the and weekend. then so that, side note, I did acro on Sunday, but okay. okay. <laughs> But I'm Look feeling, yeah. I feel like it's good prep for the Camino. Yeah. Well, you know, while we're away, maybe we could do some, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can dance, but we can maybe do some walking or something. Yeah. Some, some continued prep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Because like, may I st- yeah. yeah. Because uh, this weekend we're going to be going on a retreat. Yay. Mm-hmm. And I think we've, we've actually done an episode on retreats. We have. Yeah. So um, I can't remember what it was, mm-hmm. but it was a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to this one and I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I just show up with my beverages. <laughs> I am not uh, facilitating it. One of us in this conversation yes. is facilitating The um, social media manager for which you went is also. <laughs> Where's another <laughs> hat? Yet, yet another hat. <laughs> Helping to facilitate the retreat. That's me. Yeah. That would be you. That would be you. But yay. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it as well. Something else I'm looking forward to. What is that? Is talking about Brene Brown Guy Post 3, Cultivating <gasps> Your Resilient Spirit, Letting Go of Numbing and Powerlessness. Yeah. This is, so is this our third Brene Brown Guide Post? I think, I at think, least, at least, at least, no, I think it's our third one. I think so. We did, we did an episode just on Brene Brown mm-hmm. and how much we love her. And then we started, we decided to just start looking through some of those guide mm-hmm. posts because I think they resonate for um, some of the thinking that we, ha- that we've been dealing with in uh, um, in our episodes, mm-hmm. and just as witchy witchy women, witchy witty women, witchy witty witchy, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Say that one five times fast. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think well, one of the reasons I think that I um so am I'm, I'm so attracted to her is that for for me, the things that she say are really kind of not common sense because they're not common Mm -hmm. right but it they're really they're literally guideposts for me to live by Mm -hmm. and and i think that that resonates for me because um it's not just me in the the outside world but it's me as a witch Mm -hmm. i agree and you you and i talked about this in the in the first episode we did about her she is christian she identifies Mm -hmm. as christian Mm -hmm. and even so i find that her approach to christianity is more I would call it like more like an approach to humanity. Mm -hmm. And because of that, as a witch, I'm able to, I'm able to really access what she says Mm -hmm. and it, and it speaks a similar language to what I know and how I experience the world. Yes. Yes, totally. So as we approach cultivating your resilient spirit and letting go of numbing and powerlessness, um, it looks like we're going to be starting with the letting go of numbing and powerlessness let's, first, let's right? Let it go. Yeah, let, yeah, let's, let's let it go. Let's, let's let it go. Let her rip. Let her rip. So let's talk a little bit about numbing. Yeah, um, one of the things that she said in in the book about letting go of numbing is, and this is a quote from her: "We cannot selectively numb emotions. When we numb the negative emotions, we also numb the positive emotions." Mm, yeah, yeah. I so I I've gone through periods where I've really try to not feel my feelings i'm you know either deliberately i guess i guess all of them, they're all deliberate right can can someone make me not feel my feelings no so i guess i've been i've chosen 
on some level. Oh, maybe on some level. Yeah, on some level to um, to not feel my feelings. And I totally agree with that because, yeah, I don't feel the pain as much, but I don't feel I don't feel the lows, but I don't feel the highs. Mm-hmm. And and it, it, when I when I numb, um, I feel as if things become more gray. Mm-hmm. You know that there's it's it's kind of this flat plane, but not a flat plane like walk like walking the Camino. <laughs> But, but this kind of, you know, kind of this flat gray plane with nothing to see, nothing to do, just plotting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so just empathizing mm-hmm. with what you're saying. I, my experience of that is, is, is similar mm-hmm. and I find that mm-hmm. to be true for me. And I think there's been a couple different types of that in my life. Some, some, I, I feel that, uh, that numbing is a, is a natural response and mm-hmm. a tool and sometimes it's appropriate because if in that moment we felt the things like that would not be good. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I think that also there can be like a numbing because it's just easier not to feel or think. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that is true for me is like, I want to live a life where I experience the full spectrum of the human experience. And and that means that the joys are high and the beauty is high and the love is high. But that also means that with that comes the lows. Right. Right. And, and, and to be fair, so I, and I want to make sure that this is really clear too, because I, I, um, I did, I did a little searching on, on just on numbing because we were talking, we've talked in our circle about numbing agents mm-hmm. and things like that. And, and, and sometimes I, I think they tend to use the term distancing as opposed to numbing, mm. but sometimes it can be healthy. So mm-hmm. if you, if you've just had a shock, sometimes you, you know, some, you know, I think of the, you know, the knock on the door, the police ask mm-hmm. you to come down and identify a body. Oh, right. Geez. So, so you kind of have to distance yourself from your emotions so you can go. Mm-hmm. And um, that also happened in this book. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's why it's, it's so, it's so, um, uh, so real for me right mm-hmm. now. Um, you know, sometimes you have to distance yourself from your emotions so you can go mm-hmm. and, and identify the body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it can be, um, and distancing can help, um, particularly if you're mired in a situation of emotions, um, particularly when you, like your boundaries are not being upheld, et cetera. So distancing can be, can be a healthy uh, mechanism. Mm-hmm. And just like with anything, in my opinion, it's a two-edged sword, right? Mm-hmm. You can be, your greatest strength can be your greatest yeah. weakness that you can, it, you can overcompensate um, with distancing. And, and to me, that's actually like shutting down, for me, it's shutting down my contact to my emotions. And as Brene Brown says, you can't just like have like one window open yeah. to some emotions and then, no, it's like this metal door, um, you wouldn't, you never saw Get Smart, right? I love that show. No, you have seen. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. Every time I, normally when I talk about a television show, you say, oh, that was a television well, show. Well, it's probably going to make you, you're not going to be like, I don't know if you're going to be It was on at Nick at Night or yes, something. Yes, it was on yeah. Nick at Night. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I, I expected as much. Yeah. But I, yeah. Lo- I, I thought mm-hmm. that show was hilarious. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The Cone of Silence. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was hilarious. And yeah, as yeah. an adult, yes. I find it still hilarious. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But you know, at the end, is it at the end where the, all the doors, all the doors shut are coming and that down? Metal, yeah. I picture that metal yeah. door mm-hmm. literally shutting myself off from my emotions. So even if I wanted to just touch something for a moment, I can't because I put that metal door down mm-hmm. and it's, and it's, it's a steel, you know, stainless steel, heavy iron clad or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as, as somebody who has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, PTSD, mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that happened to me in the bouts when I'm really in the depths of it is it's like my emotional pendulum, the highs and lows. It's just like, wee, 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 wee. you know, it's like just this yeah. tiny little, yeah. I'm like moving my finger, like really small mouse mm-hmm, back and forth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, and like a lot of my work with my therapist over the, over the years has been to work through those things where that mm-hmm. are keeping my emotional pendulum that small. Oh yeah. Uh, because I, because I desire to live a life that has more emotional bandwidth than that. Mm-hmm. 
more color. And that's beautiful, but that also means that when I go to the dance competition like I did this past weekend, I'm sitting off to the side crying because I'm grieving the dance community that I lost because of oh, COVID, right, right. you know? Yes, and, yes. And, I, and then I go talk to my therapist, actually, went today, mm-hmm. and, and I'm like, no one else seems to be upset about the fact that this is gone and I'm just, a, you know, and it's like, well... Your, my emotional pendulum is now not this. Wee, 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 wee. It's like this. Whoosh. Whoosh. <laughs> yeah, and and it's like anything else. It's like uh, eventually it comes to. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. You you. Um, so one of the things I'm a Libra, and everyone thinks, oh, Libras are so balanced. No, Libras are constantly in uh, the motion of uh-huh. balancing, which yeah. is something totally different. And similarly with a, mm-hmm. a, a pendulum, when the pendulum's totally still, it's not doing anything. Mm-hmm. It's only it's only working. It's only Uh, giving information or sharing or whatever when it's in movement. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is not necessarily to stop the movement, but to just be able to negotiate the movement, right? To to ride the waves. Oh, wow. To be able to negotiate that movement. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write that down. Oh, well, you don't have to because we just recorded it. <laughs> it's going in my journal next okay. to my therapy notes. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So so can, shall we talk? One of the things that we've talked about in our circle is um, numbing yeah. and numbing agents. Mm-hmm. You, you want care to share a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah. Something I think is really interesting to talk about numbing agents is is that I there are the things that I think are pretty like culturally common when uh, they're like easy to pull up for numbing agents like eating or drinking or drugs or Mm -hmm. TV or scrolling on your phone or, you know, binging Netflix. And I I also think that numbing can look really, it can be disguised as things that culturally are acceptable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) May I? Yes. No, please, please. (laughs) So one of my culturally acceptable ways of numbing Mm -hmm. is to become super organized, Mm -hmm. the the organizer. Mm -hmm. So when I'm keeping the list and telling people to do this and and phoning folks and doing this kind of stuff, then I'm not dealing with um, my feelings, Mm -hmm. you know, unless I'm like weeping as I'm making the phone Mm -hmm. calls, but I'm usually not. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that that's my go to Mm -hmm. for numbing. And I bet people really love that you do that. And they're like, oh, wow. And I get Look such, yeah, you. I get so mm-hmm. much uh, approbation for mm-hmm. it. I get so many rewards for doing mm-hmm. that, that for many years, I, because that was my way of getting approval. Mm-hmm. And so I just did that and, and just numb, 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 numb constantly. Mm-hmm. I, I stayed numb. Be, uh, as someone who can relate, I can relate to mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. Um, be, being busy, mm-hmm. uh, but busy doing really cool stuff. <laughs> really socially appropriate like wow that's so cool uh being busy can be a way of numbing for me also being in leadership can be a way of numbing because it separates me so i get to be a part of but but separate from and then there's a and then so there's like there is a a barrier there of vulnerability that i do not have to cross because and sometimes it's not appropriate for me i shouldn't cross that vulnerability barrier because i am the fill in the blank of the leadership position Mm mm-hmm Oh, I like fill in the blank of the you know, leadership. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. but I so I just challenge our our listeners to consider uh, that the w- some ways of numbing out may be disguised as and also reinforced by our culture as being good. Oh yeah, even totally. even things like certain even certain amounts of exercise. You know, like wow, you're you're like going to the gym so often. That's so great. That can also be a way of numbing out. So I had a friend who ran. And, and, and loved it and got, you know, the mm-hmm. endorphins or whatever and all of that kind of stuff. And she began to realize that she, you know, she ran, she started to run. I think, I think she was divorcing or getting ready, you know, thinking mm-hmm. about it or whatever. So it started out as a way to get away from the situation so she could think. Mm-hmm. And then the, you know, once she started to get the rewards of the running, the endorphins, et cetera, then it became a way of not thinking. Mm-hmm. Right. So it started out. And this is, mm-hmm. this is, this is why these, these behaviors are so seductive is that they start out often as mm-hmm. healthy coping mechanisms. Sure, sure. And then just as with anything else, it's a, it's addictive mm-hmm. and, and it becomes a way of actually pushing, not pushing through, but pushing away. Mm-hmm. Tra- well, I, I just think, I just think I'm so good at at fooling myself sometimes, you know, <laughs> and if I, if I choose to not be curious and look inward, I can be really good at, at just making myself be like, yep, it's good. <laughs> and it is good. It is very good. And you're doing a wonderful service and, and, 
and and if I get curious, there's there's normally an and. So when when you uh, like, uh, mm, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I reference. So um, I have only I'd say in the past maybe eight or nine years, eight to ten years, recognized this pattern. I mean, I, I, you know, I think I've, I've known for years, but I've just kind of not dealt with it because it it worked for me on a certain level. But as I realized I needed to, um, expand my ability to open to vulnerability, you know, (laughs) I mean, just to see myself (laughs) to the possibility of potentially (laughs) considering, (laughs) considering that it might be, uh, you know, it's it's a good (laughs) suggestion to think about becoming vulnerable. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh, I'm relating so much right now. <laughs> so so when I began to realize that I need to, to I, I can't come to grips with the pain unless I actually grip the pain. You know what I mean? Uh, right? Yeah. Right? So I can't, I can't do the work by being super positive and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, thinking about it and telling everyone that, you know, I'm, I'm overcoming this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, I've got to, I sometimes have to sit in, in, uh, what was it? Uh, Pilgrim's progress, sit in the trough of despond. I have to sit in the trough of despond to be able to, to dig myself out of mm-hmm. it or swim out of mm-hmm. it or climb out of it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And, but, but I've begun to recognize that it's that, area of vulnerability that's going to allow me to really embrace all of the beautiful stuff that I really want to embrace more Mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think in those moments where I have sat in the trough of despond, (laughs) yeah, or maybe not in those exact moments, but Mm -hmm. once I've begun to emerge from the trough, I, I feel a lot of empathy. I felt more empathy for people who choose not to get into the trough and maybe they don't even realize it. I because I'm like this. It sucks down here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't. Let's, let's I don't go like to bridge. Let's yeah. get some boards. I get it. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, and and the long and the more time I've spent there, the more I the more grace I can have for people who avoid it. Whereas before, I was like, why don't people like just do the work? People, let's go. Come mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now I have a more of a sense of like I I I get it. And maybe they don't have the the spoons for it. Mm-hmm. So so you say I I want to make sure I'm clear on this. So you're saying you get it because you've actually taken that step and gone into the trough. Yeah, and it sucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, oh yeah, it's hard to it's hard to empathize with people when. Uh, when I've numbed myself so that I don't really, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't done the work. Mm-hmm. So it's like, why aren't you doing the work? Mm-hmm. But but I think I have. I, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get yeah. it. I get it. Wow. Yeah. And, and I've also had the privilege of having a lot of supports that maybe uh, people don't have time or money uh, or access to therapy or even books, you know, or time mm-hmm. to read Brene Brown. Even, exactly. Or, yes. or even, even. I don't mean this to be saccharine, mm-hmm. but even relationships like yours and mine, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where like when I was sitting on the side of the dance floor crying and I, then I, I had this thought of like, oh, I'm going to be recording the podcast with her. I'll be able to share that this is going on. Yeah. And you know, like I have access to a friendship where. That, that supports your yeah, work. Yes. That supports you. Yeah. Be- because I have learned kind of the hard way is that sometimes people like the person I was. Mm-hmm. And when I change mm-hmm. and become vulnerable, I become messy and yucky mm-hmm. and they don't know what to do with that mm-hmm. or, or they don't, yeah, they don't know what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a lot of people who are either on the path or they kind of see the path or they understand that I'm on the path and they're supportive of it mm-hmm. regardless of where mm-hmm. they are with that. Uh how would you feel about talking about letting go of powerlessness? I don't know if I, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful idea to, and thank you for suggesting that we could possibly potentially. <laughs> so, so let, yeah, let's talk about that. What does that mean? What does letting go of powerlessness mean for you? Okay. So I, I thought that this was really interesting mm-hmm. because I struggle with, I, I, I equate powerlessness, letting go of powerlessness with being with the word surrender surrendering mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to the, the reality, mm-hmm. which is that I really don't have control really over like anything, you know, like I'm on a rock hurling through space. Like all I can control is like what's inside of my head, you mm-hmm, know? And, mm-hmm. um, so, so as I was writing the notes for this, I wrote down that letting go of powerlessness 
offers me control. And I was typing it, and then I thought, I don't think that that's actually true. So then I sat there staring at Google Docs for a while. <laughs> well, you know, and, and for good reason. And had, you know, yeah, had a mini, a mini existential crisis. <laughs> and then what I, what, I, what I settled on was is that it offers me agency. Mm-hmm. That there's an agency available to me in that if I, if I let go of this powerlessness, then I have some sort of agency over how I construct and how I experience my life. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I know. I totally, I totally get, yeah. Yes. Be- oh, and let me just, can I add one more thing? Please. Yeah. Because I think simultaneously I'm on a rock hurling through space that I really can't control anything at any point in time. Like a, an asteroid could come through this window and like, you know, in my life at any moment. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I have total control. Yes. But only over, oh, only over certain things. And I'm like, in my mind, I have like this little, this little like tube around like my mm-hmm. brain and mm-hmm. in my heart. So it's like a, but I feel like I'm a witch. So I can stand in paradox of like, mm-hmm. I have absolutely no control. And then I have total control. Mm-hmm. And that the truth is that both of those are true. Right. At the same time. Right. What, I, are, what yeah. are your thoughts? So, <clears throat> so, you know, the powerlessness in, in, in Brene Brown's, um, guidepost, I struggled with the idea because, um, I'm just going to read the thing again, mm-hmm. cultivating your resilient spirit, letting go of numbing and powerlessness. And I think in that, um, in that context, it's a sense of, um, when we're letting go of powerlessness, we're letting go of this kind of, I don't know, victim maybe attitude, this victim mentality. I think so. Yeah. That, that, you know, the world is shitty and it's treating me like crap. And, and, you know, so, so, so I feel as if those are two kind of like different ends of the spectrum of, so the spectrum of, um, not dealing, let's call it that. So we have a spectrum of not dealing. And on one side, it's like totally numbing out, mm-hmm. like just, just ignoring maybe, or, or not acknowledging or not, you know, the, the fact that something shitty is happening and, and I'm having a response to it. And then on the other end of it is just saying something should, you know, just something shitty is happening to me. I have no control over this. And so I might as well just give up. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and it's not my fault. And, and then I don't have to worry about doing anything else because mm-hmm. life is just shitty and treating me like crap. Mm-hmm. And, and so basically those are like, <laughs> there's a defense mechanisms. It, it's a spectrum of defect defense mechanisms, you know, and there's probably some healthy parts of that, but, but for me, I, like, I want to let go of all of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to let go of that whole mm-hmm. spectrum. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and the way I do that is I think of, yeah, all of like all of this stuff could be happening in my world. Um, it could be happening literally to me, or it could just be happening and I'm participating in it. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not mm-hmm. even going to go there, but it's happening. I can't. I can You know, maybe you know if someone's coming in my house and trying to beat me up, I might be able to lock the doors or you know, or get a gun or you know throw you <laughs> throw me in front. <laughs> <laughs> happening on the Camino, the dogs come after us, and you just like put me in between. <laughs> it's like, what is it? I don't have to outrun the bear. I yeah, only have to you, outrun you. You only have to outrun me. <laughs> you know, so I mean, those are different things that I could do that give me and maybe an an illusion of control, or or give me some way of manipulating that scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, the one thing that I can totally control in, no matter what any of those things uh, uh, may occur is I can control my response to it. Mm-hmm. I can control um, when the people come through the house and they, even if they beat me up, I can, con- I can control if I'm going to let that, if I'm going to let myself become a victim or if I'm not going to acknowledge it happened or, or shut down, you know, where, so, so I do have a great deal of control over my part in that scenario. Mm-hmm. I can't control anybody else. I can't control the bear or the, the muggers or whatever, but I can control me. And, and so for me, that letting go of powerlessness is really accepting. And that's your, I, when you said agency, that's me stepping into the power of what I can 
con- quote unquote control. I'm doing air quotes on mm-hmm. control, but which is my response mm-hmm. and, and how, wh- what do I do with that, with that event? Um, and that it keeps, it's amazing that I read that book, that a little life mm-hmm. right before we did this episode, because I, it, there's so much in there that process to process, but because of the way these people reacted to certain things. But I, I think that that's for me, that's how I'm interpreting the mm-hmm. letting go of powerlessness. I think, I think that our culture really pushes power, powerlessness in a lot of ways. Some that are very obvious and some that are subtle, even down to like, um, you made me mad. He pissed me off. Oh. Um, I'm giving the power of my emotional response to someone else in that statement. Instead of, they did this, I emotionally reacted this way. And between that stimulus and response, there's that opportunity for a choice. And I chose to lean into the being pissed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Instead of, and of course, it's natural to have an emotional response to things. I'm a human being. I'm not a robot. And I have choice after that to, to then process that feeling and then to work through it or to, to lean into it, or to do some work, or to be curious. But I think our culture just says, like, oh, he pissed me off. Yeah, what was I just reading? Oh, I, I, mean, I was listening to, to, to uh, this guy named Bashir. But anyway, he talks about the fact, he said, um, you will be so much happier when you realize that the world is meaningless. <laughs> Meaning that nothing has any meaning until we give it meaning. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. an action is just an action and it's how we interpret it. That makes it a negative a positive or neutral or whatever. And the, the amount of negative and the amount of positive and the, well, I guess you can't have an amount mm-hmm. of neutral, right? Mm-hmm. But, but yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah. 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 And, and I've also found that, um, that if I, I can really attribute a lot of, negative things to other people and I really think people aren't thinking about me as much as I think that they are my mother used to say (laughs) don't flatter yourself yeah yeah (laughs) like so for example I was Mm -hmm. I was late I was Mm -hmm. this is a little bit of a complicated Mm -hmm. story but I was 15 minutes late Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to showing up today Mm -hmm. and um I could attribute I could say like you switched the time Mm -hmm. you're trying to trick me or (laughs) you could say like Leilani is always late. She's so irresponsible, mm-hmm. you know, or, and actually like mm-hmm. you, your experience was that I was actually 45 minutes late because, because <laughs> I had it at two you so had it two, yeah, and, yeah. and mm-hmm. I had it at two 30. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, there's multiple stories that could be written down or even stories about myself mm-hmm. where I'm like, geez, Leilani, you're such an idiot. Like, can't you mm-hmm. fucking write down the right mm-hmm. time? Mm-hmm. You know, it was supposed to be two o'clock. You wrote down two 30, you know, or you could like, there's just all this stuff or like there was a, Miscommunication. Um, uh, there's a miscommunication. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't mean anything until we until we decide. Oh my God! Mm-hmm. It means this. It, yeah, That's exactly. Right. It could just mean that we're both human, and mm-hmm. sometimes things happen. Or it could mean all of those things. It could mean it can yes. It can mean whatever. I mean, it's we make a choice. Mm-hmm. We make a choice mm-hmm. to to like fuck. Now what am I going to do? You know that kind of thing. Or okay, mm-hmm. good. I can vacuum a rug. Mm-hmm. I didn't, but I could. <laughs> you could have. <laughs> You could have. Yeah, yeah. I thought about it. I said, oh, good, I have time. Oh, never mind. So but I think tapping into that idea of, like, what do I have control over, the way I think about it, the choices that I make, the, and then how I move forward from here. And then, like, I oftentimes think about staying in my lane. Like, what is my responsibility? What am I responsible to and what am I not? Mm-hmm. I That term powerlessness is such a huge word. I mean, literally, it's a huge word, mm-hmm. right? And it encompasses so many different things, like culturally, et cetera, et cetera. And, but then she says, letting go of this huge word, mm-hmm. right? And, and often when we're talking about uh, Bren- Brene Brown's guideposts, the part, uh, she usually has the, you know, the positive thing and then what you're going to let go of, mm-hmm. cultivating something and then letting go of something. That letting go is always like a bitch for me. It's <laughs> same. It's like the cultivating. I can kind of do that. I can kind of do that. But that letting go part, it that that it, I'll put it this way. It's a it's a bitch, and it requ- it it takes a lot of me just sitting and just saying, okay, what does this mean for me? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's. A, it, I bet it. She's like the most loving bait and switch person ever. <laughs> she's like, you want a resilient spirit? Yeah. Well. <laughs> That sounds great, but let's let go yeah, of powerlessness. 
Exactly. Damn it. Damn exactly. It. So, so yeah, that's a powerful one for, for me. Do you want to yeah. talk about cultivating a root? Yeah, please. <laughs> let's move <laughs> let's, Having said that, let's move on. Yes, yeah. So, 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 um, you ha- let's talk about the, some definitions of it. I think okay. you put one and then I put another one. So you want to yeah, talk yeah. about yours? Uh, her definition is, is that a, a resilient spirit is the capacity to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. Yeah. So it's, and, and then I love because you, it's withstand, you, you actually underlined the words mm-hmm. withstand and toughness. Mm-hmm. And then a, a, I went online and found a definition and I love this. It says the ability of a, no, they're talking about um, resilience in like a, a chemical. Uh-huh. Okay. So the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into shape, elasticity. So I love uh, withstand, yes. toughness, mm-hmm. elasticity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, this, but, and it's all of those things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 what is it? The, the, um, I can't remember the willow, the one, the tree that blows in the wind as opposed mm-hmm. to trying to, uh, st- stay, st- stay like super rigid. It mm-hmm, bends. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the tree that lasts in the hurricane or the mm-hmm. tornado or whatever, mm-hmm. or survives it. And, but it requires, I mean, to be able to be that elastic requires a great deal of internal fortitude, right? Because you, it seems like you're giving, 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 or, or falling back or retreating or getting hurt or getting bent. And it, in my opinion, it takes this toughness of spirit, this kind of really strength, um, of, of, uh, of, I don't know, identity of power of understanding, self-understanding to be able to, to have that elasticity. Yeah, I agree. Rigidity is fragility. Like Ooh, rig- yes. rigidity mm-hmm. and fragility are really the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's just strong until it's not strong and it breaks. It breaks, yes. Whereas flexibility is really strength. Mm-hmm. And I love that you, you like talked about like the hurricane mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, those, the bending is actually a function of the strength that it has. Totally. I, I just, so it's, it's, I love how it seems like these, um, seemingly, um, uh, uh, oppositional ideas all kind of, uh, add up to this idea of resilience. Something that I really love about this definition too, is that it doesn't say that it doesn't go through difficulties mm-hmm. or like to further go with your metaphor. Mm-hmm. It doesn't go through storms. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, there are difficulties. There are storms. You will go through storms. You will bend. Yeah. You know, you might bend so far that you think you're going to break. And resilience is coming back from that. Yes, exactly. It's not exactly. not going through it. It's it's I'm going to go through this and I will come back from it. And that's and 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 how you choose that. That's again, you know, uh, um, sometimes you might have to distance for a moment. You might have to kind of okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let it. You know, I'm just gonna kind of let this you know, uh, uh, go for a moment. I'm not going to, to deal with it, but you, the, mm, the elasticity for me is that ability to kind of figure out what's necessary in the moment Ooh. for your, for, for, for my mental health. Mm-hmm. Right. So sometimes it might mean, you know, this far and no farther. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to let you do this to me again. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it means, okay, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to have an argument. I'm just going to mm-hmm. let them do what they need to do. And then, you know, I'll come back and figure out what that means for me. And, and it's being able, and to be able to make those decisions require a great deal of self-awareness and, and strength. Mm-hmm. Because if I, if I, I think here's here, I'd like to say it this way. If I, when I'm feeling my weak weakest, that's when I'm feeling the most, um, um, and when I'm feeling the most, um, defensive mm-hmm. and, 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 and I become a little bit more attacking, mm-hmm. you know? So, so if I'm, if I'm like on shaky ground about something, my tendency would be to just like make it all about you or to make it, you know, not about, definitely make it not about me, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, 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 um, and again, that's not going to necessarily help me. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. I really love the way you said that. Oh, thank you. I I can't remember what I just said, but I'll listen to the episode later (laughs) and maybe write it down. So Brene had five qualities of resilient people. I thought maybe we could just read it and if we wanted to just briefly comment on Mm -hmm. each quality. Mm -hmm. So the first one is that resilient people are, are resourceful problem solvers. I think that just speaks to what I was just saying. I think so. You know, being able to not necessarily solve the problem, but be able to work one's way through mm-hmm. the problem mm-hmm. and, and hopefully solve it. But mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if 
if I'm letting go of powerlessness, then that means I have agency over whatever uh, I have agency over my part of something. And mm-hmm. so then that would, if I had agency, then I could problem solve. Mm-hmm. If I'm mm-hmm. powerlessness, if I, if I'm power, if I'm powerless, mm-hmm. then I, there's no. Oh yeah. Yeah. I can't, no if I, solve. if I have no power in that situation with the other person then I, I, you know, that whatever they do, they do. Yeah. But, but I can choose to let them do whatever their behavior is mm-hmm. knowing that it's going to help me in the, in the next step. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. we're just solving the problem yeah. or moving towards pro- solving yeah. the problem. Yeah. Good. How about number two? Resilient people seek help when they need it. Oof. <laughs> All right, number three. <laughs> yeah. It just comes back to like my go-to for decades was, you know, I can do this. I mm-hmm. can do this. I can take it. Put, you know, put another thing on my bag, put another thing mm-hmm. on my back. And, and until I broke, mm-hmm. right. You know, being super, super strong. Oh, like the sister in Encanto. Oh you my know? gosh! Uh, yeah, oh, I don't remember I her cried, name. Yeah, mm-hmm. I cried during that song. Um, oh, I, we have. To, oh, mm-hmm. Maybe I'll. Do you know that? Um, so she's the one that has the, that really, the really popular song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you know that her doll sold out more than the other than the <gasps> main character's doll? Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. it's not just me who's like obsessed with her mm-hmm. and or this part of the movie or oh in the my song. Gosh. Oh my gosh. I, the first time I, I was, I, I was streaming it at mm-hmm. home. I wasn't in the theater and I just, my, like my face just dropped and, and you know, I, 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 I was like, oh yeah, it was, it was a, it was a pretty powerful moment, mm-hmm. you know, that being so strong is her strength and her weakness. Mm-hmm. Did you like that I put that song in the rich in the ritual we did with modern music? Yes. That I put that in there on purpose. Yes. I um I danced really strongly to that <laughs> as I recall. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and and so so really briefly, um in case people didn't figure that out, that was a difficulty for me. It was and and I have to say working with you has so helped me with that because um when I finally break down and say, I need help, you say, Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to it's like, Oh my gosh, I, I couldn't have done this like you know, <laughs> ten years ago or fifteen or thirty years ago, right? Thank you for saying that. I say what I want people to say to me. <laughs> Well, and there was one time yeah. where uh, I needed to, I needed, I signed up to do a ritual mm-hmm. and then I ended up having a really amazing opportunity. Oh, I remember. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, we mm-hmm. signed up for rituals almost mm-hmm. a year in advance mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. I, I had a couple of months before I had an amazing opportunity and so I, I asked if someone could support that ritual because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I wouldn't be there mm-hmm. and you jumped right in. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, if I didn't spend like an hour agonizing, cra- cracking right. that email or that message... <laughs> You know, and then like, oh my God, they're not going to love me anymore. I'm letting everyone down. And then you're like, sounds great. I got it. <laughs> like, oh, uh, uh, oh, okay. And maybe I could have just said, hey, <laughs> but yeah, but, but again, that's not our conditioning mm-hmm. or that's not my conditioning. And it sounds like I, it's, it's not, not yours as well. Yeah. yeah. So we were lauded for being, you know, super organized you know, taking mm-hmm. it on, et cetera, et cetera. And it became a part of my identity. Mm-hmm. It really became a part of my identity. And, and it's still hard for me to let that go. Yeah. Um, so, but there we go. There we go. There we go. Go on to three. Let's do number three. Okay. Resilient people take ownership of their ability to take action to manage their feelings. I am that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I slammed the desk. So I might have to take that sound out, but yeah, I'm that's, I think I'm beginning to embrace. I, yeah. I think we did a really good job of talking about that earlier in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think so. It's, it's, it's not easy, it, but, it is, yeah. but, um, I, I, one of the things that i I love about our circle is that we, you know, we're, we're not there, but we, but we laud closer and closer approximations of perfection, I think is the term. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and we support each other in that. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's go on to number four. Resilient people have access to social support. <laughs> Enough. I think I believe we just talked about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so my question is: Do they have access because it was just there, mm-hmm. or do they have access because they were doing the work that drew those type of people mm-hmm. to them, or cultivated that mm-hmm. in the relationships that they already had? Mm-hmm. 
I'd like to think it was that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because to me, a social support doesn't really count if it's not really one that I'm willing to lean on. Mm-hmm. And and Ooh, I have and wow. I have lots of opportunities to engage with lots of different types of people, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be a support. Um, because not everybody, the person at the HEB checking me out, you know, whenever I'm buying groceries, d- doesn't need to be the type of person that's going to support me. Even right. yeah. And even like my coworker that I work with mm-hmm. doesn't need, like, you know, they can just be my coworker. That's fine. But as long as I have access to people that I can count on and that share similar values to me, that's the social support that I need. That makes and, sense. And I did this, um, I did this ACEs training. Uh, adverse childhood experiences. Oh, gotcha. Mm-hmm. It, it it's about, it's actually about resiliency and stuff like this. Um, and the training said, how many people scientifically, like how many people does somebody need in order to more likely be able to come o- overcome, be resilient from an adverse childhood experiences? Wow. And and I and and I was like, one, they need they need a one person. Mm-hmm. You know, if they have one person in their life, and and the person who was teaching was like, it's two. Because one person may move for work or may pass. Oh, right. You know, yeah. or... Because you have to give them that opportunity yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but if, so, but if there are two people in your life, then that statistically is, means that likely one of them will always be around if one person moves or dies or whatever. Like, so the, the presence of two people. First of all, that facilitator sounds phenomenal they were great that 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 workshop sounds phenomenal yeah and i never thought of it that way i never thought about it that way wow that gives i have to sit and think about that yeah wow and i'm so lucky that i have more than two Mm -hmm. and and, i think so too in different areas of my life like i have i'm thinking about like the different spheres of my life that i engage in i have i have people and they have you and I, and I am had by people. Yeah. Yeah. They have me. <laughs> like, and I, am had I have, by... and they have me, <laughs> but I, I do like, yeah. I want to be, I want to mm-hmm. be that for pe- people that I care about. And I mm-hmm. want to be that for them. Yeah. And I want them to be that for me. Well, and yeah. And, and one of the things I love about having two people is that one person doesn't have to be everything. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be my emotional support. My, mm-hmm. you know, give me some instruction, you know, that they, they can be, they can be themselves mm-hmm. in our relationship and, and be, you know, if, if, if they don't have that to give, I have somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we should, we could do an entire episode yeah, on this, yeah. but like mm-hmm. the concept of, I think our culture says when you marry, that's your one person. Oh my gosh. Or your best friend that's, has to be, yeah, yeah has yeah. to be perfect. Yeah. Has to be perfect for right, you. Right, right. like, stop it. No. In, in fact, so with this book <laughs> that I just read, this, one of the characters was a, a, an actor and he was in a play. It was really a bad play, but he remembered this one part. Um, it was a bad marriage and the woman was upset about something. The guy was saying, look. You know, the, the, there's all these things you can ask for in a relationship. You know, intellectual stimulation, sex, um, be, a beautiful person, you know, aesthetic values, etc. You're you're lucky if you get three. Mm. So, what are the three that you need to have um, from that person? And and then if, you know, if you get more, it's gravy. But what are the three things that you need to have? Mm-hmm. And I just I thought, wow, because. I've, I've been guilty of expecting my partner to be everything Mm -hmm. and, and they've, they've been guilty of the same thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you recognize, it doesn't have to be three, but when you recognize that, what are the things that they, the things that I need to have from a person, what, or what are the things I need to have from people? Mm Mm-hmm. And then of those three, what can I get from this person? Yes. You know, what, it doesn't have yeah. to be, this person doesn't have to be one, seven, and eight. Mm-hmm. They can be like whichever three they embody best. Mm-hmm. And I, then I can, I have other people that I can um, draw upon for other things. Well said. Wow. 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 All right. All right. And our last one, resilient people are connected with other people. Uh, Which I... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, the difference between I mean, four and five is that five, from what I read in her book, was five is more about uh, a spiritual tie, like the idea that we are inextricably tied, like my humanity is tied to your humanity, is tied to the person in the Gaza Strip's humanity, mm-hmm. is tied to the immigrant crossing the border from Mexico into the United States, yes. is tied to my neighbor. Is tied to political opponents, to people that I don't see yeah. eye to eye with mm-hmm. in terms of our political aspirations. Mm-hmm. 
but we are we i mean we're literally all human beings and as such we share you know we share so much and um i'm i'm saddened when I, when i'm in with when i'm talking with people who don't want to see that yeah yeah i find that this point is sometimes this um this number 5 is mm-hmm. one is i is one of the things that i can feel really lonely about i can sometimes have deep moments of loneliness Ooh, that's very beautifully put. I mean, about a shitty situation, but yeah, still, yeah. <laughs> but still, no, no, really, that that really sums it up for me. That we we you just sit there and think, don't doesn't anybody see this? Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. And it's that pendulum going all the way back mm-hmm, to the beginning of our mm-hmm. episode where we talked about that numbing. It's where I I I at the same time I feel I see the vastness of the universe and the web of humanity and life that we're all a part of and like the joy and the beauty of that. And then I also see what you just said, like mm-hmm. the opposite. Mm-hmm. And, the, and then I experience that grief and that loneliness. So, yeah. 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 But I'd rather feel that and acknowledge that, that web than, mm-hmm. than not. Nicely put. Thank you. Would you care to share? You have a quote here that I think would be, Mm-hmm. Uh, this is um, for other people. Yeah. yeah, this was uh, the quote that uh, Brene Brown had at the beginning of this section of the book. It's by Terry Sinclair. She could never go back and make the details pretty. She could only go forward and make the whole beautiful. Wow. And I, I mean, she's, Brene Brown's amazing. Yes. I, I think she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that idea that I can only move forward and... And just continue in this journey to wholeness um, and to give up this this idea that I need to go back and fix the things because I did the best that I could with what I had when I did it. Oh, so true. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and to offer to offer ourselves that grace. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and others as well. Mm-hmm. Right. But to to I find it's so much easier to offer other people grace than myself sometimes. So same. Yeah. Same. I'm curious, um, would you like to speak about the poem and, and why you selected it? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. So the poem is um, by, you know, this I know, some poet, I don't know if people Never have heard, heard of her. her. Yeah. <laughs> called Maya Angelou. And um, it's called Still I Rise. And I'm trying to remember, was it for one of the, no, 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 that's, it, um, it's, it was for one of her publications. I can't remember, but I I chose it because, first of all, I love Maya Angelou, and I think mm-hmm. no matter what our, what I, I don't want to overdo her, but no matter what our episodes are, are about, that we could probably find a poem of hers that would be appropriate. Mm-hmm. But also, this is a woman who overcame childhood abuse, um, overcame, you know, uh, um, uh, domestic violence. I mean, just, you know, every time you turn around, you know, various things... And she has, she had, because she says past, but she had such a, be- and I'm sure she still has, this really incredibly beautiful, gifted soul. And for, and she transmuted a lot of her pain into some of the most poignant, life-filled poetry, words. I mean, just words that individually just speak so much. So this is her poem, Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Mm -hmm. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still, I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. 
I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wonderfully clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise. I rise. I rise. <laughs> Such a beautiful poem. Thank you so much for joining us today at Witchy Wit as we discuss Guidepost 3, Cultivating Your Resilient Spirit. Thank you so much for being with us as we talked about letting go of numbing and powerlessness and this beautiful poem. We hope you have enjoyed the magic that has unfolded here at Witchy Wit. It would be great if you would help make Witchy Wit possible and get access to exclusive content by donating on Patreon. We'd love it if you join our witchy community and enjoy shareable content on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Would you do us a big favor and support us by rating and reviewing us wherever you get your podcasts? It's free and helps witchy folks find us. Feel free to email us at witchywitpodcast at gmail.com. We love to hear from our community. Reach out and let us know what's brewing in your cauldron. New episodes are released every second and fourth Friday. Follow us on your favorite podcasting platform so our episodes go right to your playlist. You can listen as you ride your broom. Stay Stay witchy, witchy, y'all!